Strange! Yes, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness has been out in theaters for almost a week now, so it's about time I got to my spoiler talk. As is with all my spoiler talks, that is a spoiler warning. If you have not seen the new Doctor Strange movie yet and you care about spoilers, you should turn this video off, because this is where I ruin it. All right, you've been warned. I assume if you're still watching this that you've seen the movie. So let's get started. All right, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is one of my biggest issues with the movie that is America Chavez. Cause like I said, she is more of a plot device than a character. She has the ability to travel between universes by creating star-shaped portals, which yes, that is an ability she has in the comics, along with flight and super strength, which she doesn't have in this movie. Weird. So yeah, the fact that she can physically travel between universes, that's pretty much the entire reason she's in this movie at all. Cause Wanda Maximoff is chasing after her because she wants to go to another universe. I'll get to her in a bit. But yeah, America Chavez, she doesn't really have much personality. The one scene where she does is where she's sitting with Doctor Strange and Wong in the diner. That's really the one scene I can think of where she showcases any personality. Other than that, she's pretty much just scared for the entire movie. I mean, justifiably scared, she's in huge danger, but I mean, come on. I imagine she's gonna end up going the way of Black Widow, where when she was first introduced to the MCU, she wasn't much of a character either. But she did get more character development as the years went on, the more movies she was in. I hope the same thing happens for America Chavez here. And also, this character is one of a kind. There are no other variants of her in any other universes. She is the only America Chavez for some reason. That is pretty important though. Cause I mean, if there were other America Chavez's in other universes, then this movie would be broken. But they just don't give a story-based explanation as to why she's the only one. And I would like one. So we catch up with Stephen Strange. It's been a few months since the Spider-Man incident and he's at Christine Palmer's wedding. This is really where the moral of the story comes in because she asks him, are you happy? And we find out that he's still hung up on her. Yeah, I guess he just never got over her. I guess that makes sense. In context, like if you remember that episode of What If, the fourth episode, the one with Doctor Strange, it showed there too that no matter how much time passes, he's still hung up on Christine Palmer. So I guess that's just another constant among every Doctor Strange in every universe, which he actually does confirm at the end of this movie. He says, I love you in every universe, which I will say that is a pretty great line. It's like the new I love you 3000. It's a good one. Then we get to the Gargantos fight. And to be clear, this monster looks really cool. It's all climbing up buildings like Doctor in Spider-Man 2, but dude, the way it goes out, holy shit. It has Doctor Strange and so he projects these hands to grab this like lamppost or something and he just skewers Gargantos right in the eye and then he just pokes it out. It's just, I was like, oh, that is like Kong Skull Island brutal. That was the first brutal scene in this movie that let me know what I was in for. Cause of course that's not the only violent scene in this movie, but that was pretty awesome. One thing about this movie that had me scratching my head is the fact that they learned that dreams, like people have dreams, those are windows into the lives of people's multiversal selves, I guess. Which at first I was like, oh yeah, that's really cool. I would believe that. But then after watching some analysis breakdown videos of this movie, some people brought up some good points concerning Loki and the finale of Loki, where, you know, that's when they opened up the multiverse with He Who Remains when Sylvie killed him. And I was like, oh yeah, shit. Like the multiverse hasn't really been opened until very recently. So like, has no one dreamt in the MCU until very recently? Nope, that's out because Tony Stark mentions dreaming of Morgan in Infinity War. So my justification is that, you know, Loki takes place outside of time itself. So when they opened up the multiverse, that again took place outside of time. So in a way, I guess that means the multiverse was always open. It's very confusing. I feel like you have to be like a fourth dimensional being to completely understand it or something. I don't know, but there's my reasoning. Let's talk about the Scarlet Witch, shall we? First of all, I love when Doctor Strange and Wong are talking and they're like, oh, this is witchcraft. Do you know anyone who has any experiences with such things? And you hear that WandaVision jingle queuing up. Bum, 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 bum. I love that shit. It's like in Infinity War where they're like, oh, we need a place to go. And then you hear the Wakandan drums queuing up and Steve goes, I know somewhere. I love it when the music indicates where we're gonna go next. That's just great. But anyway, yeah, Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, is the villain of the movie. After the events of WandaVision and that post credit scene where we saw her with the Darkhold, now she wants to use the Darkhold, which is pretty much the Necronomicon, I see you, Raimi, to learn more about the multiverse and ultimately escape to another reality in which she has her kids, Billy and Tommy, who we remember from WandaVision. Although Vision isn't seen in this movie at all. That's weird. So Wanda is a mother who just wants to be with her kids. That's fantastic. It goes right off the story of WandaVision. After giving this some thought, I gotta say in my personal opinion, Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, is the single greatest villain the MCU has ever had. 
Yeah, that's me saying I think she's a better villain than Thanos, better than Loki. She tops them all because we've seen her as a villain, as an Avenger. We've seen her on both sides. We've followed her story all the way through. She's had the most backstory of any villain in the MCU. We've been growing with this character for seven years, so to see her take this turn to the dark side, it's shocking and also you understand. She was never the most stable of individuals, so she is going about this the wrong way. But yeah, that's what I meant when I said she steals the movie, because she does, and it's awesome. And so we learn about this thing called dream walking, which is a way of traveling to another universe without actually traveling to another universe. It's where you meditate and then you project your consciousness to another you in another universe. And right when they said that, I was like, this is everything everywhere all at once. Cause that's how they travel between universes in that movie. Yeah, I'm glad I saw that movie now so I could make that comparison. I love the scene where Scarlet Witch attacks Kamartage. Cause this is what I was talking about when I said there were some cool creepy visuals in regards to her. The scene where she's surrounded by those glass shards and she uses the reflections and it's all silent. I was like, this is freaky. And then when she comes in through the gong, she's all like contorting and shit. It's like Pennywise coming out of the fridge in It Chapter One. It's just like, Ree! That's another scene where I was like, oh my God. That is freaky. That is wild. And it also shows that, yes, Scarlet Witch, Agatha was proven right in this scene. Your power exceeds that of the Sorcerer Supreme. And it absolutely does, because she overpowers all of them here. She just wipes them all out. And I was like, uh, shit, Sorcerers, you're in trouble. Because you literally cannot beat her. And so Doctor Strange and America Chavez have no choice but to run. They escape through the multiverse portal, and this is the scene where they're going through all these universes. That's the trippy-ass scene where they're animated in one of them, they're paint in another. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. I don't think it was as crazy as the initial mind trip that he went through in the first Doctor Strange movie, but it was still pretty nuts. And so they land in another universe. I guess this is Earth 838. And here's where we see some pretty cool shit. Cameos wise, anyway. The first of which is Bruce Campbell. Yeah, people were speculating, oh, it's a Sam Raimi movie, so Bruce Campbell has to have a cameo. And yep, sure enough, he does as a pizza ball vendor. He's like, Papa always gets paid. And then Doctor Strange casts the stop hitting yourself spell on him for three weeks. Stop hitting yourself. <laughs> yeah, all right. That was funny. Then we get to this memory lane scene, which I honestly thought was a bit convenient. Like, oh, we're gonna have some emotional flashbacks now. Here's an easy way to do it. Doctor Strange's was fine, but America Chavez's, I have a problem with. Cause we see, all right, she's in her original universe as a kid. Her moms are there with her. And then all of a sudden, like this random bee lands on her hand and she freaks out. And that's what opens the portal that ultimately leads to her losing her parents. I was like, really? Wait, of all the things that could have led to her childhood trauma, it's just a freaking bee that does it? That's underwhelming. I heard that in the comics is actually something more meaningful and tragic. So why didn't they just do that? I don't know. Maybe they'll retcon it later. But eventually we run across Baron Mordo again. All right, Chiwetel Ejiofor returns from the first Doctor Strange movie to play Mordo, but not the Mordo that we are familiar with. The Mordo he plays here is the one from this universe. So, all right. We actually see Strange say that the Mordo he knew did snap on him and eventually try to kill him. And yeah, I was like, how do you know that? What, what the hell? Yeah, we all missed that. I guess it's just been so long since the first movie that we're on to bigger and better things now. So either we'll get back to it or we just won't. But in any case, it turns out that Baron Karl Mordo here, the Sorcerer Supreme in this universe, is a member of the Illuminati. Now, the Illuminati, I've heard of them in the comics. They're like this council of the best superheroes in the world. Like, I think in the comics they have Iron Man, Namor, Black Bolt, Mr. Fantastic, Doctor Strange, and I think there's one more, but I don't remember who it is. But in this movie, we have some pretty cool cameos for the Illuminati here. Starting off with Captain Carter, Haley Atwell returns to play her What If variant in live action, although I don't think she's actually that same variant from what if she could be but i'm not sure she could be just another variant captain carter from another universe then we have black bolt who i was not expecting at all i was like holy shit they got him and he's played by the same actor who played him in that god awful in humans tv show i remember watching a few episodes of that and being like all right this is shit i never finished it but they got anson mount to come back that's cool and he is the same character. He's the king of the Inhumans and he doesn't speak because his voice generates these huge supersonic blasts that obliterate everything, which we see in the flashback, which is cool. Then we have Captain Marvel, but not the Captain Marvel we're familiar with. This is Maria Rambo. Yeah, that was widely speculated because we saw her a little bit in the trailer. So, all right, yeah, it was cool to see her again. And then to everyone's surprise, including mine, Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four comes in, played by John Krasinski, who, in case you didn't know, everyone wanted him to play Mr. Fantastic, including me. And so when he came in, I was like, they did it! Yeah, that was awesome to see, and I loved his suit too, it looked great. 
And finally, we have Professor Charles Xavier, played once again by Patrick Stewart, reprising his role from Fox's X-Men films. Again, this is another one that we all knew was coming, which they definitely should not have shown that in the trailer. But I love it. When he comes in, we hear in Danny Elfman's score, we hear that X-Men 97 theme. Yeah, that theme from the animated series. Da -da 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 -da. And I was like, why of all X-Men themes did they choose that one? They could have gone with the one from the films. That would have been just as good, if not more fitting. You know, the da -da -da -da. Da -da. But to be fair, he does have his hover chair from the animated series, which I guess Marvel Studios is bringing that series back for a revival. So all right, they want to capitalize on that here. It was cool, don't get me wrong, I'm just not super attached to the X-Men animated series because I haven't seen a single episode of it, but it is still cool. And he even brings back one of his old quotes. Just because someone stumbles and loses their way doesn't mean they're lost forever. I was like, I know that quote because that quote's from X-Men Days of Future Past, which is my favorite X-Men movie. Awesome. The unfortunate thing is, as cool as these cameos are, and they are super cool, five minutes later, they're all dead. This is the thing I was talking about in my spoiler-free review when I said, yeah, these surprising shockers, they were not as relevant to the movie as I thought they would be. Because, yeah, unlike Toby and Andrew in No Way Home, these cameos are really, they're just there for cameos. I mean, it didn't feel like the actors didn't want to be there. They did the most they could with what they had. So really, it falls on Michael Waldron, the writer because I was just not a fan of that choice. The other side of that though is, yes, yeah, Scarlet Witch comes in pissed off as all hell. And again, she just lays waste to the Illuminati. It's awesome because she does it in the most brutal way possible. First one she takes out is Black Bolt. She black mirrors him and takes away his mouth. And so he panics and he's like, <laughs> and you see his head just implode from the inside. I was like, oh, ha. That, to me, was the most violent scene in the entire movie. That's the one where I was like, yeah, that was pretty damn rated R. I feel like if this movie were rated R, there would have been a lot more blood in this scene. I'm just saying, though. That was still pretty violent. Next one she takes out is Reed Richards. She just unravels him like spaghetti and pops his head open, too, for good measure. Which, again, I was like, oh, well, that's a waste of Reed Richards. I imagine, all right, since this is the Reed Richards from this universe, not our main one. When we do eventually get our Fantastic Four movie, we will have a Reed Richards of our own. And hopefully he will be played by John Krasinski, because I thought he was really good for the brief time he had. And bring in Emily Blunt for Susan Storm. Then she takes out Captain Carter by splitting her in half with her own shield. Which, first of all, I did like that she used the quote when Scarlet Witch is like, haven't you had enough? Captain Carter responds, I could do this all day. All right, yeah, that was solid. That got my nostalgic heartstrings going. But yeah, that was a pretty gruesome death, which you gotta think the writers were like, thank God, we can get away with this. It's not often that Marvel Studios gets to brutally murder their superheroes like this in their movies. So this must have been a field day for them. But yeah, that Captain Carter death was sweet. It reminded me of the scene in Studio 666 where Dave Grohl severs Taylor Hawkins' face with a symbol. Too soon. Then she fights Captain Marvel and she kills her by crushing her with a bunch of rubble. And finally, all right, Professor X steps in and I was like, all right, this could be cool. He enters her mind and he tries to rescue her, but no, ultimately the darker corrupted side of her that the dark hole created gets the better of him and she goes up behind him and just snaps his neck. And again, I was like, oh, that was brutal, man. And you see him just fall over limp in his hover chair. I was like, dude. At least we have a bunch of other movies where Patrick Stewart plays Charles Xavier. So that didn't feel like as much of a waste. And so, all right, yeah, Scarlet Witch is just on this rampage. And in this struggle, Doctor Strange and this universe's variant of Christine Palmer, they escape to this other universe, which has been destroyed by an incursion, which as explained by Reed Richards, is what happens when two universes collide with each other. They just get destroyed. So Strange and Palmer end up here while Maximoff gets away with Chavez. And this is where we meet Sinister Strange. And let's be honest, the coolest Thing that happens in this universe is that music fight. Yeah, the scene where they're fighting each other with these musical notes, that was awesome. Of course, this is the scene I was talking about that involves music where I said, this is amazing because it is. You hear the classical music going on in the background, the da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. I was like, all right, Raimi, Elfman, appealing to the musician in me. I dig it. That was just so creative. And the fight ends with Sinister Strange getting thrown out the window and impaled Saruman style. Nice. And so in order to rescue America Chavez from the Scarlet Witch, Doctor Strange from this universe, he's like, all right, I'm gonna use the Darkhold to dreamwalk back to our main universe. And Palmer's like, doesn't another version of you have to live in that universe in order for it to work? To which Strange responds, who said it had to be living? And we see that corpse Strange from the beginning of the movie. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> Raimi! We see the arm just rising from the ground. I was like, Evil Dead. 
Yep, this is so Sam Raimi, I love it. So yeah, this zombie corpse is being possessed by our Doctor Strange, and it's awesome. We even see these spirits of the damned come out and they're like, Stephen Strange possessing a dead body is forbidden. And he ultimately overpowers them and turns them into a cloak. I was like, this is wild. And so he finds Scarlet Witch and America Chavez and Wong in, what is it called, Wondagore? And that's where the final throwdown takes place. And it's a pretty cool fight between Strange and Wong and Maximoff, with America Chavez delivering the final blow because of that pep talk that Strange gives her, where she's like, I can't do it, I can't control my power. And Strange is like, yes, you can. And then she's like, all right. Yeah, as far as pep talks go, that wasn't the best I'd ever seen in a movie. But whatever, I guess Chavez gained some confidence here. I like when she's like, uh-huh, and you see Scarlet Witch go, Mm-mm, that was funny. But ultimately, yeah, since Wanda just cannot be overpowered by anyone, the way to defeat her is to have her learn her lesson, which America does. She sends Wanda to that other universe with her kids so her kids can see for themselves how much of a monster this Wanda has become. And this is actually a really good scene because you see the Wanda from that universe and she confronts her because sure, I imagine she can understand her pain, her being her and all. And she just looks down at her and goes, Know that they'll be loved. Yeah, all right. Props to that. That was actually some good writing, if you ask me. So in the end, Wanda, our Wanda, she ends up making a sacrifice by destroying every Darkhold in every universe so no one can ever dreamwalk again. And in the process, this whole structure just crumbles on top of her. So we're like, is she dead? I'm pretty sure she's not dead. Not just because of the rule, if you don't see them die, then they're probably not dead. But also, I mean, this is Scarlet Witch. It's Wanda Maximoff. We've known her in the MCU for seven years. You're gonna tell me this is the movie where they kill her off? This is where her story comes to its end? No. Call me an optimist, because that's what I am, but I want her to have her happy ending. I want her to be reunited with Vision, because again, we know that there is a Vision somewhere out there, White Vision, who got his memory restored. We saw that in the finale of WandaVision. So yeah, her happy ending is out there somewhere. I don't think she's dead here. She'll be back. And so America Chavez, who now has more control of her powers, finds Doctor Strange in that distorted universe and brings him back and so all is well. And in the epilogue, we see that America Chavez is now training in Kamertage to be a sorceress, which, all right, I don't think I've ever known that character to be a sorceress in any other Marvel lore. But we'll see what happens with her when she comes back in whatever title she comes back in, because she should. And then at the very end of the movie, before the credits, we see Strange just walking down the street, casual, normal day. And all of a sudden, those Oingo Boingo guitars come in and he just collapses. He's like, ah, and you see that third eye open on his forehead. You're like, oh shit. And then right there is where it cuts to black. I was like, oh my God, seriously, Raimi? Yeah, all right, I imagine he got that third eye from his use of the Darkhold, since we saw that's what happened with the other Sinister Strange. And so during that whole animated credits sequence, I was like, what does this mean? Apparently it means he's fine, because the mid credit scene comes along where we're introduced to, surprise, surprise, Clea comes in, played by Charlize Theron. Yeah, I didn't see that coming at all. One final surprise cameo. Good job, guys. Now, I've heard of the character Clea from the comics before. She is actually a pretty important character to Doctor Strange. She's a love interest to him. She's a dark sorceress. She's actually been known as the Sorceress Supreme. And also, I just read this, she is the niece of Dormammu. Yeah, you remember Dormammu, I've come to bargain. Holy shit, all right. So now Doctor Strange and Clea are gonna team up to do something in the Dark Dimension. There's been an incursion. Damn, all right. We're Where's that gonna go? I imagine we're not gonna see them again until Doctor Strange 3, whenever the hell that comes out. Hopefully less than six years from now. And then the post credit scene is Bruce Campbell's Stop Hitting Yourself spell coming to its end. All right, so it's just a joke. Boo. I'd rather have all the credit scenes mean something, unless it's really funny, like the one in Spider-Man Homecoming. This one was not that funny. So, okay. In conclusion, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, I enjoyed it. Ultimately, I'm let down by the fact that, you know, I thought this whole MCU multiverse arc that started in WandaVision, Loki, What If, Spider-Man No Way Home, I thought this was like the culminating chapter of all that. You know, I thought it was all like leading to this, but it just turned out to be another chapter of it. Which, all right, you know, subverting expectations. I'm not completely bummed out by that because we do have more to come. Another season of Loki, we have Kang the Conqueror still out there. He's gonna show up in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. I do imagine that is gonna lead to something big in the MCU. We just don't know what it is yet. So that's pretty exciting. But as for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, still a pretty fucking sweet movie. So where do you think we might see these characters next? Doctor Strange, Clea, America Chavez. Where and when do you think we'll be getting their next adventures? Whatever you think, go ahead and leave a comment. And of course, thank you for subscribing. Peace.